This is the 39th video supplement for CIS 351, Grand Valley State University's course in Computer Organization and Assembly Language. This is the first of three videos that discusses how to call functions in assembly. This video will focus on the machine instructions used to support the calling of functions. It also discusses how to pass parameters and retrieve return values. Almost all software is organized into reusable named groups of code. These groups can go by several different names depending on the language used, subroutines, procedures, functions, methods. If you're being very precise, these terms all have slightly different meanings. But I'll leave the discussion of those nuances to the programming languages course and simply use the term function. In this video, we'll look specifically at the instructions that support the calling of functions. So let's begin with the most basic function behavior, the ability to execute a block of code and then return to the original position. Consider this code. There are two functions, closest price and absolute value. Notice that closest price calls absolute value twice. So as I step through the code, notice that the first time I return from the absolute value function, control returns back to line five. And then I call absolute value again. And when I return from absolute value this time, control returns to line six. So how does the CPU know which line to jump back to when I return from the function? Well, the CPU will only know what line to jump back to if it saves that information. So what exactly is that information? Well, it's the address of the instruction that should be run after returning. In MIPS, this is the program counter plus four with respect to the instruction that causes the function to execute. MIPS provides a special instruction to do this called jump and link. Jump and link is just like jump, except it also saves the value of the program counter plus four into a register. So do you see any challenges in implementing the jump and link on a MIPS? In particular, any challenges with getting the value of the program counter plus four into the register you want it in? Let's start by looking at the jump instruction. With this in mind, what problems do you see trying to convert this into a jump and link? Well, the main issue is that there's no room for the destination register. We've already used all 32 bits, six for the opcode and 26 for the jump target. So where are we gonna specify what register to put this PC plus four in? The obvious thing to do would be to take five bits from the jump target and use it for the destination register but we don't want to reduce the number of bits used for the target address any more than we already have. The target address is 32 bits, and we've already squeezed that down to 26. As we discussed in the video on jumps, squeezing the number of bits down works okay because all text addresses begin with four zeros. However, if we reduce the number of bits further, that just means that the jump and link and the jump target will have to be closer together for that assumption to work but this assumption won't work with respect to function calls. If you think about it, there's no good reason to expect that a calling function should be placed in memory anywhere near the function it's calling. Take, for example, the print line method in Java. Many, many different methods throughout a large Java program will call print line, so they all can't be put nearby. So since we can't assume that the upper bits of the jump and link instruction are the same as the target, we need to make sure that that target address contains as many bits as possible. So how else can we specify where we're going to put that PC plus four value without taking bits away from the target? The solution the MIPS designers came up with is to always store this value in register 31. This register is also called RA, which stands for return address. This register is technically a general purpose register. We can save any data in it we like. You could even put the results of an arbitrary add in this register. But by convention, programmers only use it to save a function's return address, hence its name. We call this type of parameter an implicit parameter. Its value is implied by the instruction rather than being listed explicitly in the machine code. By making the parameter value implicit, that value doesn't take up any of the limited bits in the machine instruction. Not only does MIPS have a special instruction just for entering functions, but it also has an instruction that's used almost exclusively for returning from functions. This instruction is called jump register. 
It works just like a jump, except the target is stored in a register instead of an immediate value. Now, when returning from a function, the register used is almost always RA, because that's where the jump and link put the value, but you can use any register you like. Now, interestingly, as you can see here, this jump register function is an R type instruction. We need one more thing in order to use functions effectively. We need to be able to pass parameters and receive return values. If one function is going to pass parameters to another, then both functions need to agree on where that data is going to be placed. In MIPS, the convention is to place the parameters in the registers A0, A1, A2, and A3. The next video will discuss what to do if a function has more than four parameters. Also, by convention, return values are placed in V0 and V1, although V1 is used only if the return value is larger than 32 bits. This use of the A registers for parameters and the V registers for return values is just a convention. The hardware will allow you to use any registers you like, as long as the calling function and the function being called agree. However, managing the code is much easier if everybody just follows a single convention, especially in larger projects where different people or teams may be writing the different functions. It's easier to write the code if you just automatically know that the parameters go in A0, A1, A2, and A3, rather than having to look up for each function how you pass the data. Okay, so let's see some example code. For context, we'll be looking at the assembly version of this code here that compares two prices to see which one is closest to the target, either over or under. The basic idea is that we take the absolute value of the difference between A and the target and B in the target and see which one is smaller. When written in assembly, the code looks like this. So up top, we have the code that's part of the closest price function and then the absolute value function down at the bottom. But to start with, I'm not going to treat closest price as a function. I'm just going to start running this code from the very beginning of the program. So we'll begin by assembling the code and stepping through it. The first three lines just initialize some data to be used as parameters. So our price A is $9, our price B is $12, and the target is $10. And now we take the difference of price A from the target, and we need the absolute value of that. So notice that the difference is the parameter to the absolute value. So that goes in A0. And then on the next line, we use the jump and link to call the absolute value function. Before we do that, take note of the address of this jump and link instruction. It's 00400010. And the instruction after that is 00400014. So now when I execute the jump and link function, the next instruction I run is the first instruction of the absolute value function, but also down here you can see highlighted in green that the return address 00400014 was automatically saved in register 31. So now we can execute the absolute value function. We'll compare the parameter to zero, since the parameter in this case was positive, or not less than zero, the branch will be taken, and we will copy that positive value into v0, because v0 will be our return value. So we set up the return value, and then we execute the jump register, which will jump us back up to the line right after that jump and link, 00400014. So we're going to call the absolute value function again. And when we do, it'll overwrite v0. So we need to move our return value out of v0 so it doesn't get clobbered. So here I'll move it to t3. And now I will subtract the other price, price b, from the target, again putting it in a0 so I can hand it off to the absolute value. This time, the address of the jump and link instruction is 00400001c and the following instruction is 00400020. So notice when we execute the jump and link, 00400020 is what gets put down in register 31. This time the parameter to the absolute value is negative, a negative two. So we compare that to zero. It is less than zero, so this branch is not taken. And so we need to take the negative of the parameter. We need to turn it into a positive number. So we'll subtract it from 0. Notice when I do that, since this is the last calculation we need to perform, we'll put that result right in v0 so that it is ready to return. This time when we return from the function, we jump to instruction 00400020. 
because that's what we saved in the return address, and we continue on with comparing the prices. So now we compare those two absolute values. Price A, which is a dollar away, is closer than price B. So this branch is not taken. We'll take price A, which we stored in T0, move it into V0, which is where our return value goes, and at this point, the closest price function is done. Now, we didn't call it as a function, so I'm not going to execute the instruction here. But the important thing to see is how we set up the parameters to the absolute value by putting them in A0. And then when we came back from absolute value, we looked for the results in V0. So this sample code here is good for demonstrating how to use the A registers, the V registers, and to call and return from functions with jump and link and jump register. But there are some problems with the code. And we'll discuss those problems more in the next video. But for right now, I want to at least show you the symptoms of the problem. So now I'm going to open up a slightly different version of this code where we'll call closest price as a function. So here I'm going to initialize the parameters a, b, and target to 9, 12, and 10, and then use a jump and link to call closest price instead of just diving right into it from the beginning of the execution. So when I do that and run through the code, what you're going to see is that the code enters an infinite loop. You can see here it's bouncing back and forth between the SLT on line 32 and the jump register on line 35. So take a few minutes after this video ends and see if you can figure out what the problem is. What's causing this infinite loop and how can we fix it? In the meantime, Remember that we use the jump and link instruction to call functions. And this JAL function always stores the return address in register 31. You don't get to specify where you want that address saved. It's just always saved in register 31. So this type of parameter is called an implicit parameter. We use jump register to return from functions. By convention, parameters are passed in registers A0, A1, A2, and A3. Likewise, by convention, you put your return value in V0 before calling the jump register. Now, these are just conventions. You don't have to do it this way, but if you do, it'll make your code a lot easier to write and make it a lot easier for others to work with your code. In the next video, I'll explain what the bug is in the sample code, and in video 41, we'll see how to fix it.